everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. We have um, Mike Godart, who is talking about his book, In Search of Lost Lives, Desire, Some Scars, and the Evolution of a Mind and Soul. And I wanted to talk about the last part, the evolution of a mind and soul, and how um, learning about your past lives helped to understand about the evolution of your consciousness. Tell me a little bit about um, what you learned about your past lives and how they were evolving. Well, what really drove home to me, uh, CJ, was that I'm a spiritual being having human experiences. And um, going back to some lives, I mean, I didn't appreciate basic things about people you know, experiencing pain, having regard for human life, so I was able, as I went back, to see specific experiences in particular lives that happened, that realizing that animals are living beings who can feel pain and starting to be a vegetarian, for instance. Mm -hmm. I have a very kind of graphic description of that uh, when I was living in Macedonia. So it's this whole evolution that was taking place that was preparing me uh, for this lifetime, when I was initiated onto a very rigorous spiritual path, one key life, I mean, it really speeded up the spiritual evolution 12 lives ago when I lived in Tibet. And I was a, I ended up being a very high up government uh, official. I was basically head of protocol, <laughs> and, <laughs> which was no easy thing because of China uh, doing its thing and everybody jockeying for power. And interestingly enough, my connection to this life is my favorite game is playing diplomacy, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but during that time, you know, I started because I needed to going to Zen monasteries and I had this like direct experience of two monks, one in particular, is, here is a human being who has evolved and it really kind of set me going, looking for that. And so th that was sort of- Wait, a human being that is what? I didn't understand Evol that. Evolved. Who, uh, okay, got him. Who, okay. Whose consciousness can reach to the heaven and stars, is okay. what, I, what I felt. Right. Okay. And that began to really accelerate my spiritual evolution. Okay. Uh, very much so. This, and, this life in Tibet when you met this other human being, that's what kind of fueled your, your interest? Is that what you're saying? That, that in particular, I mean, it, it actually kind of began 36 lives ago mm -hmm. when um, I had like a, we call a paranormal experience. This is in the life uh, with, with the brother we had talked about in the earlier segment. Mm -hmm. And I'd gone to bed and I'd been feeling really, really down. And I was woken up in the middle of the night and there was literally a light being across from me, mm -hmm. a, a few feet away from me. And it just kind of kept coming and coming, coming toward me until it merged in me. Mm -hmm. And because of those actions, and actually that was the life I became a vegetarian for mm -hmm. the first time in many, many lives. Mm -hmm. That it's very involved because a lot of stuff happened after that life between lives. But then it was like my fate was sealed that from then on, I would only be a human being. I would only reincarnate as a human being. Hmm. What's unusual about my book, In Search of Lost Lives, is that I depict lives when I've committed really hurtful actions mm -hmm. and I lost the ability to incarnate again as a human. The next hmm. I took hmm. animal lives. Oh, and wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I fell down and took an, an animal life. So that I devolved in those cases. Hmm. Okay, God. So what was your, what's your understanding of human life and human consciousness and how it's different than animal consciousness and how does one devolve? Well, what makes us different is that we have discrimination. We can ascertain between right and wrong. So if you're killing something or someone inflicting pain, ideally you should know better. Um, you know, we've been graced with so many saints and masters, fully realized souls, and they're like the most gentle beings you could ever meet. 
mm. and the most powerful. Mm. So people would be shocked if they knew all the millions of lives they had. I actually recovered my number, my total number of human lives, and that is 4,137. Wow. So, Earth is a very tough school. That becomes pretty clear in my book. Wait, so you had those 4,137 human lives, but there were also animal lives of which you devolved, you know, you... Yeah, there were many animal lives uh, between that. Um, yeah, actually. And when I uh, talked about that life being merging in me, that, that kind of sealed my fate for not falling down again. Uh, into the animal world. Mm, okay, so now, that was the beginning of your human evolution in consciousness. And so from that, you said that there are many lives um, in which you kind of, um, the Tibetan life, which was a, another life in which you actually started evolving your consciousness. What are some of the other kinds of pivotal lifetimes you think that helped you look at this? You had started off by saying your spiritual being having in a human experience so <clears throat> what does that mean like in this particular context help me map so your spiritual being having a human experience so your soul that has had these different lifetimes after lifetimes learning about um slavery learning about um Tibetan protocol, learning about, you know, certain actions that will kind of devolve you back. Um, is that what you mean by spiritual being having a human experience? Or did you mean something else? Well, well generally, that's what I mean. I mean, we, we come into different lives with, with different things to learn. You know, like the slave lives were hard, and they were all very different. But one of them was to learn how to kind of really have self-control. Mm -hmm. and find the rules and keep myself together, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we come in with different, with different objects, uh, actually. I mean, when I was a banker, part of that life was to learn compassion. I was, uh, until they, I was loaning people money as, as a banker. But, but that, was, that was a life two lives ago when I was a British banker, which really I had the most um, transcendent and important spiritual experience as a human being because I got posted uh, in India during the British Raj. And all of a sudden I thought, gee, I'd like to visit the Taj Mahal. And as it happened, uh, the railroads had just been completed there from Bombay to Agra a few years before. So on the train, uh, I was ostensibly going to visit this other British expat expatriate and this Taj Mahal, but then I had this, all of a sudden, maybe I can meet a Swami in Agra. And I kept feeling this, you know, stronger and stronger. So one of the first questions I asked when I landed in Agra to my host is, do you know of any masters or Swamis? And he said, no, I don't. And then a few minutes later, he said, oh, but I think I have an, uh, an employee, a servant who follows one. Mm -hmm. Well, long story short, I was brought that afternoon to meet this fully realized master, which was, you know, like the major spiritual experience of my life, you know. And actually, that's the first thing I recovered because I'd always felt a strong connection uh, mm. with this teacher. And I thought, he is so familiar. Uh, mm. And so I was very, very lucky because I don't know how many Westerners got to meet him, but I did. And that what was, was this Swami's name? Swami G. Okay, Swami Jean. Swami G of, of Agra. Okay, got it. Wow. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, okay, so that that was totally cool. And I, <laughs> my first visit to India, I just this was before I had any idea. You know, I had three days in Delhi, and I thought. I'm going to Agra and yeah, I'll see the Agra Ford and the Taj Mahal, but no, I really want to see where Swamiji lived. And wow. I got there and it was just a revelation. I was this is when you were a banker. And it's so interesting because no, you're- No, no, this, this was this lifetime. Oh, this was, lifetime. Yeah, oh. when I was, when I was uh, just turned 25, it was my first trip to India. 
I've been there now 13 times, but I had three days after my stay at a spiritual ashram colony where I was in Delhi. And I all of a sudden I felt this pull, I've got to go to Agra. And it wasn't about seeing the Taj Mahal. I wanted to see where he lived because I had heard the street name of where he lived. And when I went there, it was like this un unbelievable homecoming. I wow. was just delirious with joy. <laughs> <laughs> this is so when you look at like your evolution, it's like every single life you're learning about a different positive human quality or maybe even a negative human quality you know which is like you know to drive someone to kill him with someone there's certain you know there's something avarice greed whatever but then you're also once you became like fully into human evolution it's like you're learning about compassion you're learning about freedom you're learning about different things and so um that's basically what you're talking about of the evolution of consciousness yes yes exactly okay so in the next segment what i want to do is talk about how someone who thinks i want to do this and then a little bit about what the benefits i think you've talked a lot about the benefits of doing this but i actually want to talk about like how you it sounds like you have the gift of just like you know remembrance of these things but how someone who's interested in recovering their past lives could go about that um, we've been talking to michael goddard about his book in search of lost lives desire some scars and the evolution of a mind and soul thank you so much thank you Susan.